and welcome to the Books on Asia podcast, sponsored by Stonebridge Press, publisher of Fine Books on Asia for over 30 years, located at www.stonebridge.com. And I'm your host, Amy Chavez. Today we're talking with co-author Wes Lang, who has written a guidebook with Tom Fay called Hiking and Trekking in the Japan Alps and Mount Fuji. This covers northern, central, and the southern Alps of Japan. So, Wes, maybe you could give us some insight on the mountain huts. Uh, We hear a lot about mountain huts when you're climbing uh, in Japan, and especially Mount Fuji. They offer mountain huts where you can just relax for a few hours or stay overnight. And do you need reservations? Um, What are some tips for people on mountain huts? A lot of places allow check-in after 2 p.m., 3 p.m. It really depends on the the season and and the location. Um, So if you arrive early and check in early, you get the best kind of space available. That's a good tip. And mountain huts don't really sell out so much. They don't really become fully booked. They'll just keep letting more and more people in. So the more people they let in, the less space you have on your futon. Sometimes you have to share your futon with another person. (laughs) That's like so Japanese. Very inclusive, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, so I guess for mountain etiquette would be keep an open mind when you come. Yeah, and it makes sense. You can't really turn away people, right, in the middle of the mountains. You can't really turn away people. I mean, the thing, if you're staying in a hut, so when you stay at hut, you can do what's called sudomari, which is staying without meals. Mm -hmm. It's basically just a place to sleep. And if you're doing that, you can pretty much show up any time. If you're staying with meals, if you want to eat dinner, you have to arrive early. Because oh, a lot okay. of huts start serving dinner at 4.30 p.m. or 5 p.m. So they really want you to arrive at the hut by 3 p.m. if you can. And you would be so, expected to have all your own bedding with you, right? Your sleeping bag and such. Uh, it depends on the hut. Most of the huts actually have futons. You don't need anything. The only thing you need is basically yourself if you have, and money. Since <laughs> they, don't take credit, they don't take credit cards, so you need to have cash when you're hiking uh, in Japan's mountains. So, yeah, you basically just show up and they'll have futons. Now, in parts of the South Alps, they have just sleeping bags that you can use. But if you bring your own sleeping bag, you get a small discount. Mm -hmm. And that's all detailed uh, in the guidebook as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, in the back of the book, there's a full list of, like, all the mountain huts in the Japan Alps, as well as all the the mountain huts on Fuji. Mm -hmm. So for people that that want to do it. Now, Fuji's a little bit different. You need to book the huts uh, in high season because they get basically fully booked. But when people stay at a mountain hut in Mount Fuji, you're only staying for a couple of hours because a lot of people, they'll climb up, you know, let's say they'll start climbing at 6 p.m. They'll get up to the 8th station or ninth station, maybe around 11 p.m., and they're just going to sleep for a couple hours before uh, sunrise. Whereas in the rest of the Japan Alps, people are arriving, you know, 3 p.m. And then they're checking out at 4 a.m. or 4.30 a.m. or 5, depending on if they eat breakfast or not. So. And um, what about the hot springs? It just strikes me as, I mean, you're in the mountains and a lot of them, um, you know, uh, would have natural hot springs. And how easy are they onsen to access? Uh, that's a good question. There's a lot of hot springs, especially in the North Alps. Um, for example, Tateyama uh, is a very big kind of hiking and a tourist area. There's some hot springs around uh, Tateyama. So at the trailhead, you can find some. Up in the mountains themselves, uh, in Hakuba, there's one kind of famous onsen called Yari Onsen, which is uh, way up in the mountains on the edge of the tree line. And there's a mountain hut there. And then that mountain hut has a hot spring. And so that's a mixed hot spring. So they basically allow men and women into the same bath. Mm-hmm. So whenever you come into mixed hot springs, traditionally everyone kind of bathed together in Japan, um, men and women together. Uh, recently, uh, a lot of women, when they go in the bath, they cover themselves up with a towel or a swimsuit as well that's becoming more and more common and what about the men it depends a lot of guys don't really cover Mm -hmm. up so much so that's kind of an issue um now with a lot of mixed hot springs um in japan 
some of them will have a, a separate area for women. So mm-hmm. there's kind of two sections of the bath. There mm-hmm. might be one section of the bath that's kind of walled off and then another section where it can be men and women together. And that's the same at the uh, Yari Onsen Hut in the Japan Alps as well. There's a little separate bath for women and there's the kind of communal area. So in mixed bathing then, is, is it optional to wear something? Or really you should wear something if you're a woman or...? Uh, it's completely optional. My experience in Japan is when you go to a mixed bath, for example, up in Tohoku, um, a lot of the elderly women just don't care. They just come out, you know, completely <laughs> burying themselves, whereas the younger generation tend to cover themselves up more. It sounds like common sense, but if you go to a mixed bath in the Japan Alps or in uh, anywhere in Japan, just don't stare at people. You know, <laughs> I don't know, look at the trees or the, you know. Yeah, do everything wife. you can to not look at anyone. So, so I have a funny story about mixed bathing. And the reason I'm kind of asking you these details is because um, I came to Japan in 1993. In Okayama and some of the other places that I had been, uh, I've been to like three mixed onsen before uh, the scene happened, which I'm going to tell you about. But everyone was just, you know, naked and no one really cared. And one of these places was even like on, on top of a, a public building. <laughs> really? So other people could even look out. And um, so, okay, whatever. So then I go to Hokkaido, and I'm with, there are three other gaijin friends, but they had just moved to Japan, and um, we were all up in Niseko for the winter. And so I decided I'd take them to this mixed onsen, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's no big deal, and this and that. So we go into uh, the onsen. This is the first time I'd been there, too. And someone had given us, like, free tickets because they can be quite expensive, like a thousand yen, you know, for these really nice ones that are, you know, out in the mountains and such. Probably not the ones, you know, that you're talking about, but this one was. When we went in, no one was at the, the desk to take, you know, the tickets or anything. So we just left the tickets on the, you know, the counter there and went in. And so they had an indoor one, onsen, and an outdoor onsen. And so... Okay. The indoor one, okay, people were just milling about as normal, right? And uh, I saw a couple women wearing these, like, you know, cover-ups. And they were the same one. And so that kind of, at first, I was like, oh, that's weird. Anyway, so then we, <laughs> I, I'm the first one, I go to the outdoor onsen. And they have these long ramps to get down to it. So, you know, I'm just, you know, <laughs> waltzing down there naked. <laughs> I get in, and there's some people quite a few people already in there, men, all men. <laughs> and then the other guys come from uh, the, the men's side, right? And they walk down a different long ramp to get down into the onsen. And they're just like, you know, chucking down there, <laughs> stark naked. <laughs> when they get in, and I realize that we're the only naked people. <laughs> <laughs> and you're actually supposed to wear a costume of some sort, men and oh, women. Right. And, but we had no idea because there wasn't an attendant when we went in to give us one. <laughs> oh, we were right. all so embarrassed, kind of like, oh, the dumb guy gene, right? <laughs> so yeah, I'm exactly. extremely careful from now on to know the rules before I go in. I remember there's one hot spring on Sakurajima uh-huh. Island down in uh, Kagoshima. Yeah, by the volcano? Yeah. yeah, that one's a mixed bath, but it, there's a shrine inside the bath. Mm-hmm. Cool. One has to wear white. So they give you these like white robes to wear. Oh, wow. And I remember going to there, but I don't know if you've ever tried to take a bath while wearing like a heavy white robe. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, yeah, it was very, uh, a heavy it wasn't very white robe. comfortable <laughs> bath. It's like swimming with your clothes on. But anyway, that mm-hmm. was my experience with, with well, being that's kind of wearing awesome, isn't it? I feel like we have to broach the subject of uh, tattoos and hot springs. That's always a big topic for foreigners. So a lot of baths will not allow you to have uh, tattoos at all. Um, It really depends on the place that you go. Some places will allow you to cover them up with like a band-aid or a bandage. Some places will just uh, refuse you outright. I don't have any tattoos at all, so I don't really have to worry about that kind of issue, but I know in other countries, uh, tattoos are becoming more and more popular, so 
anyone who has a tattoo uh, needs to keep that in mind. A lot of places will have signs that tell you yeah. what tattoos are allowed. So it might be a good idea to actually, if you have small tattoos, just go ahead and cover them up. Yeah, and that way there's less there. chance of you being refused. Um, I yes. think another thing is, because I, I hear this a lot uh, from you know tourists, is that they get a bit uh, angry that they're not allowed in because they said, well, they say, well, obviously I'm not a gangster because that's where this, the reason the tattoos aren't allowed is because it, you know, tattoos have had a long relationship with the Yakuza gangsters. But I think people who say that are kind of missing the point because the reason they don't allow tattoos is because if they allow anyone with tattoos, then they have to also allow the gangsters, right? Yes. You can't put down a rule and say, well, we're going to accept exempt foreigners from it or this or that. So what they're trying to do is to keep out the gangsters. And, uh, you know, I have a bit of experience with this just because I also run a business that, you know, we have to be careful of, you know, these kinds of people coming is that they will absolutely scare everyone away from your business. So once yes. you get them in, then you cannot refuse them to get them out, and then your whole business goes down the drain because people are afraid of them. My experience in the um, in the Japan's mountains, I haven't run across too many. Well, I don't know. It's hard to tell who's a gangster and who isn't just by looks alone. Mm -hmm. so a lot of a lot of the tattoos. I think a lot of people don't realize this is the tattoos that the gangsters wear. When you're wearing a shirt, they're completely covered up, so you yep. really have no idea. Mm -hmm. Oh, believe me, I'm on the beach, uh, we see it all the time. These people, you know, come up and they're so polite and they're so nice, and you know, they they sit down at the bar, and then you know, because uh, I run a beach bar in the summer, and then you know, like an hour later, they'll just all take their shirts off. <laughs> Yeah, same time like, <laughs> you know because they're wearing those um you know the uh rash guards the long sleeve ones there's another one yeah. look for long sleeve rash guards and then it's just like you know there's this collective <gasps> <laughs> and i've even seen people go to the uh ex extent as to rat i mean you can't chase them out right but you like put up a bamboo screen <laughs> around them <laughs> In other ways, the, the Japanese gangsters are kind of polite in that if there is a sign up that says no gangsters, they won't go there. They, they're not interested in going places that don't welcome them. They're interested in going to places that tolerate them. So it's just something people need to you know, be considerate of um, and understanding of that there are reasons behind these things. And it'll be interesting to see how Japan moves forward as they do start to accept you know, more and more uh, foreigners, you know, going to places with tattoos. And I'm wondering how they are dealing with this situation um, that lies underneath it. Yeah, that's a good point. I think another thing, too, when people come to Japan, the train situation is can be a bit of a culture shock, uh, not only in terms of how crowded some trains can be, but when you take the Shinkansen, and you have a non-reserved seat. So a lot of people who have a Japan Rail Pass, you know, you can take the trains that, but you get a basically non-reserved seat. So if you're traveling during peak times, they don't realize that the train can be 200% capacity or 150% capacity. So when they go to the non-reserved seating area, there's no seats and then you have to stand. I've seen foreigners kind of complain to the, um, the train conductor, where's my seat, where's my seat? And I'm like, well, it's kind of first come, first serve. You have to, you know, if you don't get the seat and unfortunately you'll have to stand or take another train that's coming along. It, it, it's really an issue during like the big holiday seasons like Golden Week and Obon. I wanted to ask you what some of your favorite hikes are in the guide and what are some kind of real gems that, you know, most people wouldn't uh, think of or do or what might be especially scenic? Japan is just is so full of uh, nature and mountains and there's so much to see and there are so many trails. So I would like to get uh, find out what are your favorites. Yeah, um, I think everyone should go to Kamikochi at least once in their life. Uh, that's in the North Alps. Easy access from Matsumoto City. 
Um, every time I go to Kamikochi, I'm just awed by the beauty of the place. I mean, you're in this valley surrounded by these huge rocky peaks that just rise up um, out of the valley, and it's really, really beautiful. Even if you're not climbing one of those big peaks, just going into the valley, there's hot springs uh, in Kamikochi. There's easy kind of uh, day walks that you can do that are flat um, along the valley. So even though it is kind of a very touristy place, I've always had, you know, a lot of good experiences there just walking around because it is so stunningly beautiful. I prefer kind of mountains that are a little bit off the beaten path and a little bit less uh, crowded. So in the book, probably my favorite hike is called a uh, hole. Uh, it's like H O hyphen O and that means Phoenix. So it's kind of the Phoenix peak and uh, it's in the South Alps. And the reason why I like it is because it has a lot of unique rock formations and it's kind of got this sandy granite. It's almost like sandstone that you're kind of walking on. And the reason why I like the South Alps a lot is because you get really good views of Mount Fuji. And every time you see Mount Fuji up close, it's just so impressive. It's like a perfect cone. And so rather than climbing Fuji, I think if someone climbs Fuji, that's great. If you're going to climb Fuji, it's also good to look at Fuji from another mountain and get a perspective of what you've been up. And, oh yeah, um, what it looks like. I like to uh, run trails, and yes. so would those be good trails for runners like me? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the if you're staying in Kamikochi itself, in the valley, it, it's pretty flat. You can run, you know, up and down the valley to your heart's content. If you're running up the mountains, I mean, the the Japan Alps are an incredibly steep mountain mm -hmm. range. And so I think when foreigners come to Japan, they don't realize how like steep the mountains can be here. Right. So if you want to run up the mountain, uh, take lots of breaks and take your time. But I mean, I think a lot of the mountains around Kamikochi are quite exposed uh, with chains and ladders in places. So it's not a place that you really want to run quickly per se, but down mm -hmm. in, the, in the lower valleys. It's a perfect place. So have you not been to Kamikochi, Amy? No, I haven't. That's your homework this summer. Yeah, no, Great. I have yeah. been to Matsumoto, and I've certainly been like in Nagano, and the, I've also run the Nagasendo parts of it. Hills are okay, but probably mountains, no, because the, you can't, well, there is such a thing as mountain running. But yes. Um, yes. for me, what would be perfect is like hills, but not mountains, um, where you wouldn't have to walk up the entire thing because, you know, no one can really run up an entire mountain, right? You'd have to take, you know, so many breaks. So something that, you know, might be 20 Ks uh, with some varied terrain. In the book, the easiest mountain to climb is like Norikura Dake, which is, is kind of near Kamikochi. Okay. But that one, actually, you take a bus up to like 2,700 meters. Mm-hmm. And so you'd Ooh. actually be able to kind of run in the Alpine. It's a series of like volcanic kind of hills with these volcanic crater lakes. It's a really stunning kind of area. Wow. So if you have knees, Amy, you could take the bus up to the uh, trailhead at Norikura, run up Norikura, and then run all the way down the mountain, down to the base, uh, which is Norikura Kogen, which has hot springs and it's a ski resort and so that could be a challenge for you as well. Excellent. But I would recommend first maybe going to Kamikochi, testing out your legs on the flatter parts of the train. You can run all the way up Kamikochi Valley. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it's all the way up past like Yoko and up toward Yarisawa to mm -hmm. the start of the Yari Katake trek and then run up toward Yari as far as you can to get a view of it and then come back. That would be a really good. Is that in the book? The route up to Yari is in the book. Okay. Um, so yeah, you could follow that. I mean, this book's a little bit different from other guidebooks because every page is like full color gloss. Really? So actually, yeah. I mean, it's it's completely like full color print all the way through. Some guidebooks will just have color inserts in certain pages, right. and the rest is kind of like you know one color print or two color. But this is like full on gloss, and also it comes with a handy cover. Mm -hmm. That'll keep your book dry. One thing to keep in mind with this book, we wrote it from two different angles. One, yes, it's kind of a hiking and trekking guidebook for visitors to Japan. 
But at the same time, since both Tom and I live in Japan, we wanted to actually write a book that was geared not only for tourists, but also for long term residents in Japan. Oh, well, so that's we wrote a good that point. With mm-hmm. Them in mind, saying, okay, we live in Japan, we're experienced hikers and experienced trekkers. Um, we want something that's going to be valuable to people living here who, who can already speak Japanese, who want really good maps, who want the uh, most up to date transport information. That's the stuff that you really need with um, a good guidebook. And one thing that the publisher gave a green light on from the very beginning was we said we want to have bilingual maps. We want to have the kanji characters on right. the map so、mm-hmm. that. It'll be really useful. And so they were like, okay, we can do that. And so even in the hike descriptions, all of the Chinese characters are there as well. The maps are full color, they have contour information as well.、Um, we recommend in the book also buying the Japan maps made by Yamato Kogen, which you can buy at any Japanese bookstore or outdoor shop if you use those in connection with the book. You know, the good thing about those Japanese maps is they're waterproof. So if you're in the rain, You probably want to keep the guidebook in your pack, but you can hold the map out you know, in the rain and then look at those things. I think you know, one thing that people don't realize when they visit Japan and they go hiking in Japan,、uh, even when you go to an area as popular as Japan Alps, the signposts are not always in English. You know,、right. Even on Kitadake, which is the second highest peak in Japan, you get a mix, some. Signposts are in English, but there's a lot that just aren't at all, and it's just all in Japanese. And if you can't read any Japanese and you go up to the signposts, that's why we thought, okay, it's good to have the Chinese characters in the book、uh, to help people when they reach a junction that they don't know which direction to go. So the book itself looks really good.、Mm-hmm. You know,、nice、I'll, go on a, I'll go on a limb and say that it's the best looking Japan hiking guidebook ever. Published. I'll、cool. let the reader decide about the content itself if it's better <laughs> than what has gone before it. But I think we did a pretty good job of, of putting this book together. We're happy with the way that it came out, the way that the maps look, and the way that the, the photos came out. So we're happy with the end product. Hopefully,、uh, the readers out there will enjoy it as well, and it will be something useful and part of their libraries. I wanted to ask you, can you just elucidate a bit on the Hyakumezan? Like, tell people what it is and how long it took you to do it and why you decided to do it? Hyakumezan is a, basically a list of 100 mountains in Japan. Some people translate it as the 100 famous mountains, or it's not really a list of the 100 best mountains. It's just a list that this author created in 1964,、uh, Fukada Kyuya. And it was based on a series of、uh, magazine articles that he had done over a number of years. And those magazine articles were kind of collaborated into this book called Nihon Hyakumezan, which is basically a list. It's a, it's a write up of these hundred mountains that he had climbed in his life and mountains that he liked. He had some criteria in terms of history and beauty.、Um, And so he kind of put those lists together. His book、uh, was translated into English and it's published by University of Hawaii Press. So you can actually read the English、uh, translation of that book. He created it as a list of like, you know, these are 100 mountains that I like. Now, this list became kind of the de facto list and it's kind of like this list that everyone wants to kind of climb in their life. And so I decided that I was going to climb this. List, I don't know when, maybe 2002 or three, I decided to do this. But of course, there was no information out there in English. So I was just using Japanese guidebooks and kind of researching myself. It was before the age of social media. So there was really no place to get information or ask for information. So I was kind of on my own when I did it. I finished in 2008. And at that time, I was the first. American to finish the Hyakumezan. There's、mm-hmm. been one other woman, Ginger Vaughn, who's also finished. That's right. She yeah. was、mm-hmm. the second American. We were kind of doing it around the same time.、Mm-hmm. Um, I have been to finish kind of before, but it's not really, for me, it wasn't really a race. I wasn't really, you know, planning. I wasn't really saying, I want to be the first,、right. you know, person、yeah. to do this. I just, I just wanted to do it kind of in my life. So I was really lucky that I was able to. To do that. And on my website, which is hikinginjapan.com,、uh, I have a 
basically an online guidebook to the Yuck Maison. Anyone who wants to climb those mountains can do that by looking at the information on my website. Okay, that sounds great. We'll put all that information in. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And, you know, I had often want, thought about going back to Mount Fuji, but after reading your book, I'm definitely going to go back and do it. You should. Yeah, everything that you need to know is in there. So Thanks for your you inspiration, Wes. No problem, Amy. And if you do do it, we can have a follow-up podcast, and then you can chastise me. <laughs> you said in the book. No, uh, no, I'm, I'm sure it'll, it'll all be good. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. All okay. right. Well, it was great talking to you, Amy. And you too, Wes. Thanks so much for joining us on uh, Hon, the Books on Asia podcast. All right. No problem. My pleasure. That was Wes Lang, co-author with Tom Fay of Hiking and Trekking the Japan Alps and Mount Fuji. You've been listening to the Books on Asia podcast, produced and edited by Michael Palmer. Logo by Alex Kerr. Sponsored by Stonebridge Press, publisher of fine books on Asia for over 30 years. They can be found at www.stonebridge.com. For more interviews, book reviews, and other features, visit the Books on Asia website at booksonasia.net.